We're going to slow it down tonight singing out light of the world. Uh, he is our God who stepped down into our darkness, stepped down into us, into our sin, into our loss, our loneliness, our, our, our hurt and our shame. He stepped down into that, reaching down that nail-scarred hand unto you and I. That hand that was nailed to a cross because of our sins. He didn't come down with retribution. He didn't come down with vengeance. Instead, he came down with mercy, with grace, and with love. Does anybody need a little mercy tonight? Then we're going to take some time and cry out to the God whose mercy is renewed morning by morning. He is the God that receives the worship of his people. Open your heart tonight as we sing out Light of the World. Light of the World, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes and let me see.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The psalmist writes, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let us speak up as we give our God praise tonight. We're going to take a moment and we're going to pray. We're going to believe God together for miracle power. I want you to continue to lift up Pastor Wayman Mitchell, leader of our fellowship, for God's strength. I was talking to Pastor Olson today. He called, just the other day, he called Pastor Mitchell uh, and had a very uh, uh, lucid conversation with him. He said uh, uh, he's still as sharp as a tack as far as he can tell. But, uh, we're going to continue to pray and lift up Pastor Mitchell for, before God, praying for the entire Mitchell family as they're working through a uh, uh, step-by-step. Please pray for Greg Mitchell, Pastor Greg, uh, and the upcoming conference in Prescott and all that is on his shoulders, all that is surrounding that. Uh, be in prayer as well as we pray for all the special uh, requests and needs as we're praying for, for uh, Kathy's dad, praying for Christian's mom, praying for William's dad, praying for McKenna, Believing God for Mia, uh, Vanessa, need all of these need uh, a miracle from God. We want to pray that God would move not only on us, but our daughter churches, lifting up the matters uh, in Lakeside, uh, the Wolves in Escondido, and the Carls uh, up in Temecula, that God bless them wonderfully. Yes, amen. We want to pray that God's hand be on our leaders, Pastor Olson, Pastor Rice, uh, Pastor Cox in Redlands. God, give them wisdom and insight and direction. And let's continue to say, uh, uh, stand firm. We rebuke uh, this coronavirus. Uh, uh, get out. Get out of our people. Get out of our shores. Get out. All of the craziness that's surrounding things, all of the difficulties. Pray for our leaders. Amen. Pray for our national leaders. They need wisdom in, in dealing with all of this. Uh, they need God's help uh, in making wise decisions. Uh, we want to pray for our evangelist tonight, that God would anoint him by the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, and that God would speak to us. How many of you need to hear from God tonight? God sees your hand and your faith. Uh, I want you to take a moment, talk to God. We're all going to pray. And then as our prayers come to a close, uh, uh, right where you're at, if you would, uh, uh, Quentin, would you lift up your voice and open us in prayer tonight? Let's pray together, church. Father, we pray, trusting in you, believing God, your word and your promises. So we rebuke COVID-19. Get out. Get out of our shores. Get out of your lives. Lord, I pray all that have been affected by you to preach in your glory. Restoration. God, we're asking you to move in this service. Everyone in this world, go into their hearts, God. I thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for grace and mercy tonight, God. We love you. God, we need you, God. Desperate, God. Lord, for your love, God, and your direction, God, in these times, God, speak to our hearts. God, in this place, give us direction, God. Touch our families. God, we ask for open doors and opportunities to minister to our, our community, God. Touch the Mitchells. Uh, uh, God, we pray for our leadership churches. God, we take dominion. God, stand on the word of God, Lord, for our, our nation. God, pray, we're praying for our daughter churches. God, help them to be fruitful, God, and revival. God, speak in this place uh, through a man of God, Lord. We thank you for this week, Lord, and all that you've done. God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Normally we take some time to shake hands, greet each other. You can just wave to those that are around you uh, and know that you are welcome here at the Potter's House Christian Fellowship Church. Those of you live streaming with us, uh, we thank you for joining in with us as well tonight. Uh, uh, I'm going to uh, dismiss our song service team as we're going to quickly turn our service over to our evangelist. I do have an announcement uh, uh, if I can get some help this Saturday morning, uh, Pastor Dave Fowles in El Cajon, his church is moving from the corner where he's at down to the end, uh, uh, right at the very end cab uh, of the building, uh, better visibility, you don't have to go behind a locked gate to get to church, it's a good move for them. Uh, he's wondering if we've got some 
some Holy Ghost filled men that would be willing to. I told him I'll bring my truck over if you've got uh, opportunity to as well. Uh, 8 o'clock, he's asking us to meet at his church, 8 o'clock uh, uh, this Saturday. If you can help out, let me know. Uh, just uh, hit me up with a text or just just, uh, just a word. Let me know. Uh, will many hands make light work? Uh, we'll be able to run over there, uh, help him set up, uh, pray over it, uh, and, uh, and watch as God begins to fill you yes, in, uh, Come on. Uh, in El Cajon. Tonight's our last night uh, of this revival. We'll be back on our regular services on Sundays, 9.30 Sunday School, 10.30 service. Uh, it is Father's Day. This Father's Day will be preaching for fathers, this 10.30 uh, service Sunday morning, and then we'll be back again 6.30 on Sunday night. Uh, thank God. Uh, we have had a tremendous time. Uh, as again, Bob Burris has come for us. Uh, uh, we've been in prayer. I mentioned to you before, we've been in prayer since the shutdown that God would help uh, our evangelists, uh, that God would uh, yes. protect, preserve, and still use that ministry. Uh, and we see that the knife is not dull. That God has still kept an edge. This preacher over here can still preach. And tonight, I believe he's going to bring a word from God directly to us. Let's give him a hand as he comes. concerned over the situation because I really am concerned about people. But I'm not vexed or worried or upset or fearful about anything. Just, just, I, no, I just, it's just the way I am. I'm just not, doesn't bother me. I'm concerned about people, but I'm not concerned about what's going on because I serve a God who's a big God and I trust him. He's pulled me through a few knot holes already and helped me out, so I've got nothing to worry about. Man. I, I believe in him. And I got a word for you tonight. I really do. You know, even way before, uh, even way before I got saved, there was some I, some things happening in my life that I, I, I didn't understand. And uh, you know, like for instance, when I first met my girlfriend or my wife, she was fourteen, I was sixteen. The minute I saw her, I knew that she was the one I was going to marry. I, oh. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I can't explain these things. I, I mean, it wasn't like just oh, she's good looking. No, I knew, <laughs> I knew that she was the one. I knew it. I knew I went through school, and I'm not that smart a guy, but, but for some reason, you know, I, I navigated uh, the schooling very well, and, and uh, there was gifts that were working in my life that teachers recognized, and so they, they made me valedictorian both times. I graduated eighth grade and twelfth grade, and, uh, you know, I even flunked trigonometry in, in high school, and they still made me the valedictorian, because they say, you know, there's other things besides just edu the, the, the education part. There's the le leadership qualities. And so, Pastor Olson, I went on a crusade with him in 1986 in the India. It's the first time I met the man, and I went, I went up to him and, and told him our lives are going to be wound together, woven together for the rest of our life. I just met him, first crusade. And if you know anything about the history there, for the last 35, 40 years, our lives have intersected and we're connected. And it's just, and so it's, you know, I can't, I can't. I knew, I knew who, the, I knew my kids were going to marry. I told my daughter, I told my wife. When my youngest son got married, I, I picked, I knew the girl, I picked her out, said, it's that one right there. <laughs> I mean, I didn't tell him. But, I mean, I knew, I knew who it was. I just, I just looked at her and I just felt that presence and, and just knew it. And so I told her, and sure enough, that's the one after about a year or so, they noticed each other. And before you know it, they're married and they got kids. And, you know, and so I'm telling you tonight, what I'm, what I'm preaching tonight is prophetic. It's, it's something that I know. I can't quantify it, I can't add it up, I can't, it doesn't make sense, and yet I know that I know, amen, what's going to happen. So I want to preach tonight a message that I've entitled Revival, A Fresh Season of Discovery. 
This is what God's going to do. This is what God's going to do for us. Amen. I'm going to start with a few stories about people because America is still the greatest country in the world. Everybody say amen. 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 Yep. I've traveled to 31 nations, preached all over the world, and there's nothing like America. Now. I come back in, I want to hug the ground, kiss the tarmac, and hug the, the, mm -hmm. the flag again because I've been in places where the governments are filthy and horrible and uh, un untruthful, and you can just feel the shit. You nobody, it's just bad places to be. Amen. But God's protected me. And so I want to talk to you about a few people in America that have just uh, they had uh, seen things and had the opportunities. Because America is a land of opportunity. Amen. It's always been a land of opportunity. Yeah. So we're going to share a couple of stories and we're going to preach a little bit. I want to talk about you know a few people, a man by the name of Black and a man by the name of Decker and a man by the name of Larry and a woman by the name of Mary. And we'll work these two. And so this is a story about vision, about seeing an opportunity and then just stepping into it and where it taking it, where it took them. And so in 1910, these two men were 20 years old. S. Duncan Black was one of them, the guy, and Al Alonzo Decker was the other. They, were, they quit their jobs at the Roland Telegraph Company and founded a company, a little company called Black & Decker. Anybody know the name of it? Mm -hmm. About Black & Decker. Yep. They built, at that time, in 1910, they built and sold bottle cap machines, auto shock absorbers, candy dipping machines, and other specialty equipment for industry. They were, that's where they were solely at. And they probably would have stuck in the industry uh, sales forever, but had it not been for an article that they saw in World War II, as World War II happened, they were uh, always reading stuff, and so they, this, I, this report caught their eye, and they realized in this report, it said that there was a record wave of employee thefts of portable power tools from the U.S. Defense De Company. So, in other words, uh, they realized that there were people, that American workers were getting really used to using government power tools in their job, grinders and cutters and stuff. And so, what they did is they took, they they saw that opportunity, and uh, in the post-war planning committee, they de designed a line of home power tools that premiered in guess what, 1946, right after the war. And these were the Black and Decker power tools, and the rest is history. Last 2016, they had a revenue of 11.41 billion, net income of 965 million, 27,000 employees. And this this is just two young men uh, who are making some of the machines, different bottle caps, but they saw something and they saw a vision, an opportunity to maybe start a business that would very be profitable because they knew those those men got addicted to working with power tools. They don't want to go back to hand tools. They want to have power tools, and so they made a company and, and they prospered. And so this is a story about people, amen, that uh, that prospered. And so as we go back down through it, I'm not going to pass out. I'm not going to have enough time to get through this. But I want to get through it. And so Psalms 119, 126, three verses. We're talking about a fresh season of discovery. I can't explain it, but let me tell you tonight, I'm going to tell you and go on record that it's on its way. Psalms 119, 126 says these words. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. We need to ask ourselves tonight, you know, what time do we think it is? You know, this is making an exceptionally uh, pointed question here. It's time. It is time. I pray God, it's time. Yes. Begin to move in the Holy Ghost. We need a revival. Therefore, so because it's time, therefore, the psalmist says, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, even above fine gold. See, how much is God's word really worth to you? Is it, is it something that you've heard us talk about? But you know, this, this is God's story. This is God's plan. These are the answers to humanity's problems right here. This has been around for years and years and years. And we all have 24 day, hours, seven days a week, and we can spend on whatever we want. But if you haven't realized that you need to be in this every day, you know, you need to be you need to get yourself to a place where you can be in this for as much time as you need to be, that you don't have to you don't have to worry about the time. Mm. You know, as an evangelist, I have a great opportunity to spend a lot of time in the Word of God. But you know, if you, this, I don't care if you gotta get up at three o'clock in the morning. Well, I'm busy, I got that. I know we, our lives are full of stuff and things to do, but this is important. I mean, Amen. Psalmist says, because it's time for God to work, I love your commandments. So how 
much do you really think about the word of God? You know, talk about value tonight, the true treasure. That's what the Bible calls it, the pearl of great price. The ten lepers healed and one came back. Praise God. And Jesus said, well, where's the other? Where, where are the nine? We got to ask ourselves, where, where are we in this? In this? Do, do we really do we, do we really believe that these are the answers to man's problems? And if we read it and digest it and meditate on it, that God would keep our mind. You know, I can't I can't see myself reading, not going. Without reading the Bible in my schedule, I read it in the morning when I get up, and I read it also when I get up my nap, because I take a nap, because I'm getting older, and I just can't function at night if I don't have a nap. <laughs> and so it's, it's just the way it is. But when I get up my nap, it's like I do the same thing I did when I get up at 4 in the morning, is I go to the Word of God, and I spend an hour or two just reading and thinking about God. And and so, you know, that's that works for me, but, but you know, how about yourselves? You know, are you, are you the one, or are you one of the nine that... God touched and just drifted off. Verse 28, the last verse I want to look at. I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. So in life, there are seasons. There's seasons of the soul. Books have chapters, pages. Life and time moves forward, and I believe there's a fresh season of discovery. It's just on the horizon for our fellowship, for the world. Not just our fellowship, but for the world. I, I can't explain it, but I, I've thought about it for 30 years. I got saved in, a, in a, an actual move of God where God was moving. We would show the same movie a hundred times, and then we'd pack the place out every time people get saved. Mm. You know, Thief and I, we'd, 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 we'd show that movie until it burn holes in the film. Because it was just, it would just we'd show the movie and a 16 millimeter film. And, you know, I'm dating myself now, but... And then they would come and get saved. And, and so with that thought in mind tonight, I want to apply it to our fellowship as a whole. And I want to talk to you about how this new chapter, this new season is going to come about. I pastored in Globe from 1988 to 1996. That was the last church I pastored. I was there eight years. And that was 24 years ago when I left that church, turned over to another man and went into the evangelistic field. And as I was sitting in the office many times there, and even in the church prior to that, I would think about, you know, God, are you going to, are you, are you going to do it again? You know, are, are you, are, are you going to visit the earth again? Like you, you know, because when I got saved, it was just, it was just God. You know, just, you know, you didn't have to preach to him, you didn't have to do anything. He just, they would just come in and say, well, how do I, what do I have to do to be saved? And it was just, God had already touched our hearts. And we were like 20-year-old you know, renegades. We were wild people, but God reached in and touched us, changed us. And I'd ask God, God, is, are you ever going to do that again? And I believe he's going to do it again. Oh, or maybe he's going to come for us, come through for us. And I, I believe with all my heart. You know, I have beliefs, and I believe with all my heart that God has been busy building our fellowship. Our, you know, the world's a much bigger world, but in our fellowship we have this uh, uh, nucleus of churches that we've built and that God has done that for a reason. He's built that through discipleship, put people, and he's still doing it, but it's, those churches are there for a reason, and that reason is when he decides to move again. Oh, man. And when he moves again, churches are going to go, I preached a crusade in Africa. You know, churches were 50 people the Saturday before. The Sunday after that crusade, there were 2,000 people because five, 7,000 people got saved that week. And, you know, churches just mushroomed. And so, you know, God, God, God can move in powerful ways, and I believe that we're just a structure. We are, we are part of a network of churches. And, you know, we have no ill feeling about our brothers in the Baptists or the Methodists, the Lutheran, the Episcopalians, the Pil you know, the Pil and all the rest of them. You got to love them, you know. But he's been busy placing us all over the world. And the church I got saved in was the fifth or the sixth church out of Prescott. I don't remember, you know, it was right, right in, the very, you know, in the first ten. And today, we, in 50 years, we've got 2,700 2, churches. And so I've been around for a while in this thing, and I believe that this is what's happening in our fellowship. Come on. We were birthed in revival. This fellowship was birthed in revival. This church is, has its roots in revival. And so revival began when God found a man. We've been, we're praying for him, William Mitchell, and began to stir his soul to what? A fresh season of discovery. This man was wanting to do something for God, having problems, amen. And one, one time he received a word from an evangelist that came through. It was Isaiah 58, 12. 
And it said, he said to him, Wayman Mitchell, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of paths to dwell in. And you know, the last 50 years that has come to life in his, his <coughs> ministry and through his ministry and through all that's happening. Others, other men in our other other generations have experienced similar stirrings. We know John West, we know all, but you know, this this is what we're a part of. And so you read books, you pick up on that. In the beginning of our fellowship, we experienced that season of discovery. And what it was was it was a season of discovery of the timeless truths of the Bible. I can still remember uh, going to, to conference or going to the subject class and hear those first sermons on those what have become what we call them today, 50 years later, they're the distinctives of our fellowship. But back then, they were the first time we were hearing these truths uh, preach on prayer, preach on evangelism, preach on giving, you know. These things were just brand new to us. They were like we were discovered, uh, we were discovering these these. Bible truths that we didn't know. You know. We just lived the way we lived life. We didn't know nothing. But yeah, here come these truths. You know, prayer. Prayer was an incredible. Back in the 80s, when I used to do a lot of crusades overseas, we were reaching out into a lot of these nations. We have churches now. As we begin to expose those people, those people in those churches, we have three, four hundred delegates, and then we go to have a crusade at night. But as we begin to uh, preach to those people, we would we would begin to preach to them about prayer and the privilege and the place and the power of prayer. And in fact, many of our conferences on Tuesday morning, uh, as the conference started Monday night, then Tuesday morning, the first seminar, the first American preacher who was there would preach on prayer and set the tone for the rest of the week. And then at the conclusion of that day's ministry, we would challenge the pastors that were there, that had been invited to the delegates that were there to meet us, the people who were bringing this crusade conference to them, to meet us in the building we were at the next morning at 8 o'clock, to pray for an hour before we started. And many times that's how that's how the conference has started. And those who, that was a, that was a discovery. That was something we, none, none of us really thought about, but that's what we discovered, this incredible power, stewardship, the proper, hand, the proper handling of money, you know, evangelism, the call to assume personal responsibility, in this arena, all of these were 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 fresh discoveries to us, and they were they were like they were like potent. They were like a narcotic. They, we had just never heard this, and yet these words were coming out of the Bible. This little man, about this tall right here, would just <laughs> preach these incredible sermons on on these specific topics and challenge us to begin to to step into that and believe God for that. The dignity of the local church, Come on. you know. The indigenous church. This is the this is the self-sustaining, self-supporting, self-governing church. All this needed is provided in the church to replicate and build. And we see that in our fellowship from one church to 2,700 churches in 50 years, because these are these are uh, timeless discoveries of truth, and they work. Uh, discipleship, the training of workers, the, the raising up of workers. You know, you have three churches out. You know, and these are just these are not professional preachers. These are just construction workers and truck drivers. You know, these are these are guys. You know, I was just a concrete finisher. I pushed a wheelbarrow. Hmm. You know, poured concrete, bent a few nails on a few buildings, and you know, I didn't, I wasn't no you know, blue blood raised in a proper. You know, I was just just out there. But God reached down and just plucked me out of that and then put me in this incredible <coughs> thing that's been going on now for 50 years. Glory. And I believe with all my heart. Listen to me tonight. It's coming. Amen. It's coming. I don't know how, how all this stupidity and nonsense moves it, but it's, it's getting set up for God to just swoop down and just blow through it. And when, when he does, you need to be ready. Amen. Because yeah. you're going to see a bunch of pierced, a prodded, not headed people that put things in their skull. <laughs> they're going to start walking. And they're going to look as weird to you as me and my wife look like. To those, uh, that first little church that blew up in Bullhead City, uh, 18 and 20 years old, long hair. I went to church with a leather vest and bell bottom boots and a, 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 you know, one the original uh, uh, a tie dye shirt, amen. And you know, smell like patchouli oil. You know, because we smoked pot and smoked pot. We went to church, and, and, and I just, just you know, we're just there. And all these people are 1950s, leave it to Beaver people. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, was, it was so bizarre 
<laughs> we just got up and walked in that church that day. And, I mean, there were good people. The, the high school basketball coach was there. There were people in the community that I knew, but they were not anything like me and Jenna. And they just kind of looked at us, you know. You know, within six months, there were 40 people like us in that church that had 40 Amen. of those old people. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it blew up because they couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle what God was doing. It just blew them away. God just did it. You know, now these people just getting saved or just our friends. And many of them went on to become preachers. Many of them become, went on to become leaders in our fellowship, preachers. And, but, you know, they didn't see it. They, didn't, they were so far removed from truth that they didn't recognize that God was doing something incredible. And so it went right through their fingers. And uh, it was a few, uh, I think a couple years later before Pastor Mitchell, you know, in 74, 75, sent a man down there. And he, he said, this guy, this guy wasn't even a disciple. This guy was just a sheet metal bender for air conditioning fabrication. <laughs> and he got a job in Bullhead. And he was like in his mid-40s. You know, he was... The disciples were mostly 25, 30-year-old guys, and this guy was a middle-aged middle, middle -aged guy, and he just asked Pastor Mitchell, can I go down there? I got a job down there, and uh, can you think maybe I could maybe do something, maybe start a Bible study? He said, sure, let's do it. And, you know, he came down there, and within 18 months, all those people, all that 40, group of 40 uh, hippies and, and, and wild people uh, that, that were now back on the beaches, uh, you know, at Friday night you know, around a fire, Burning, uh, you know, burning a fire on the Colorado, drinking beer and taking mes uh, mescaline and all this other, you know, stuff and talking about God. It was just a weird, <laughs> really a weird time because we didn't know what was going on. And then he came down there and we came back together. And so, these are the truths of God's word that built our fellowship. It's time for revival, and so we need to think about this. See, it's decision time tonight. See, there is a right and there's a wrong. You read it in verse 28, 128. There's a heaven, there's a hell. If there's a heaven, there's a hell. There are winners and losers. Not everybody gets to win. I know my, my daughter's moved to a very liberal city, and they don't have, they don't have uh, you know, uh, copper, brass, silver, and gold. They have, but they're all gold medals. Everybody gets a gold medal. They're just high, high gold, light gold, real gold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but everybody wins. Nobody loses. There's no losers. It's just, it's just everybody's away. Well, I hate to tell you that there are winners and losers in life. Yeah. The precepts, thy precepts, God's word, are foundational in all that I do and I am. These, I, I look to God for the direction of what I should do. I don't, you know, I, I give to Caesar's what's Caesar's, but we need to give to God what's God's, you know. And so, yes, I, I know that people got all kinds of ideas, but I, God's word right here is found, and so. Everybody has an opportunity to get one of these. And everybody can read it. And, and uh, your God will help you. He will, his spirit will help you. Amen. And you need to believe it. Because that's that, here's the choice. Let me just break it down to you real simple. You're either going to believe what God says, not just believe it mentally, but lean into it, trust it, and be vulnerable with it. Or you can go believe what you want to believe. You walk out of this church tonight, go out there and just believe whatever you want to believe. And in the end, we'll see who has the truth what was truth and what wasn't truth because we're all going to come we're all going to come together in the end we're all going to come together and so you need to think about that so it's time to do it again God so secondly I want to talk about uh, these are truths that are rediscovered by some revisited by others but I want to talk about privacy the truth about privacy the truth about privacy in the word of God 128 therefore I esteem all thy precepts that's the word of God concerning all things to be right. Not, oh, well, that's just the way. No, no, they're right. And I hate, I hate all the falsehoods. And so, can I tell you the truth about privacy tonight? Because we've really kind of been hinged on privacy for quite a while. The truth about privacy tonight is simple. There is none. It's that simple. There is none. Listen to the Bible. Hebrews 4. For the word of God is quick, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Pierces even to the divine asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. That's why God's word is. It discerns the thought and the intent. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature, no creature, no animal, no person. See that? That happens. Now. That just gets up on my voice there and it just turns it into like a much. But this right here will heal it real quick. <laughs> The elixir of life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
There is neither any creature that is not manifest in his sight. And all things before the God we serve are naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. There's not a thing that you've ever done. There's not a place you've ever been that God has not seen you completely naked all the time. There's nothing, there's nothing hidden he doesn't know about. There's nothing you've done. There's nothing you're doing right now that God's not aware of. He knows he sees it all. He knows exactly. And so there's no privacy. You, know, you might want to think it's private, but there's no privacy. The truth is there is no privacy. At best, it's an illusion. It's a mirage. It's a lie. It's a deception. You know, I talked about that Psalms 130 verse about the entrance of that words is light. We're not going to go back into that, but the buzzword of this generation is privacy. Everybody's concerned the NSA is, is, uh, is spying on you. The government's spying on you. They're, they're watching you through your phone. They're collecting data through your phone. You hear me? They're collecting data right now. <laughs> they popped on the spectrum and came on. Hallelujah. They're tracking every move you make through GPS. The drones are spying on you. Can I just give you something? Kind of, if you're not aware of this, let me just give you a little bit. Of, this is old news, but let me just tell you what's happened. There's a, there's a surveillance software that's available to police departments in cities all across America that is the, made, been, been, been made available by the government. It's called Stingray. And what it is, is the local police can buy it from the government and they can place a parked van in a neighborhood. And that parked van acts like a cell phone tower. It's not a cell phone tower, but to the cell phones, it looks like a cell phone tower. And they can uh, fool all the cell phones in that neighborhood to hook up to it and download your photos and anything you got on your phone. Anything that's going on, they, because the phone thinks it's a regular cell, cell, cell tower that they can bounce off of. But what it is is a van with some, some heavy duty stuff in it, and, and uh, they, get this, they, they reach in, get the reception, come in. And so there's, there's no privacy. They already know. Amen. So there's an article, there's a company I read developing an email service. These are, these are Americans, which says that even NSA can't read. We're going to have an email service that, that even NSA can't break. Really. Really. You, you really think that's going to happen? See, the truth we need to face when it comes to privacy is simple. God's been reading your mail since day one. Amen. There's no letter getting by him that he hasn't already looked at. He didn't look at his little x-ray vision can look right through, no exactly. You know, and so you know, oh we're gonna we're gonna build us an email service that even the government can't read. Well, like, you shouldn't be worried about the NSA. What you should be worried about is GOD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the GOD is who you need to be worried about. Because he's been reading your mail and you're still alive, so that'll show you one thing. He's a merciful God. Yes, amen. amen. Because many of us should be dead. Come many on. of us you know, should have already been taken out, but God, through his mercy, has allowed us to still stay on. Yeah. And so the word of God is the discerner of the thought and intent of the heart. And so, I want to close with, with just a story about a girl that just, she just, she's a real woman. I picked her story up out of a book on uh, 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 women, I don't know what the name of the book was, uh, Wild Women or Bad Women or Tough Women. I don't know, but it's, a, it's a story. So I want to leave you with this question tonight. This revival, I want you to live with what will they say about you when all has been said and done? What will they be saying about you when all has been done and said? It's history now, it's recorded, it can't be altered. See, we're living life, our lives are fluid, we can make, but there's going to come a day when that time is going to be done. And when that time's done, what are they going to say about you when it's all been said and done? There's no to do it. See, this is a pioneering spirit days gone by. So this is a real woman. Her name was Mary Fields. She lived 1832 to 1914. She was one tough woman. She was born a slave. She was a black woman from Hickman County, Tennessee. She was born a slave in America around 1832. And she was freed when American slavery was outlawed in 1865. She was freed from slavery at 33 years old. So there's two questions I'm going to ask you the rest of the night as I work through her story. One, what will they say about you when it's all been said in two? And two, what have you done since you were set free from slavery, a slave of sin by Jesus? Come on. Her doctrines might be a little questionable, and it is, 
but her spirit is undeniable. From 33 to 52 years old, we don't know what this black woman did. She got free from slavery and she just disappeared for 19 years. But we do know history records that after 19 years, uh, she had experienced probably enough obedience training for her lifetime. So she stormed into Cascade, Montana in 1884. She's 52 years old. It's a 52 year old woman. Now she made it clear when she got there that she was calling her own shots. And heaven help the brood who tried to bully her. Not that a 52-year-old feels she was a brawny six-footer who tipped the scale around 200 pounds. And she didn't look like a woman that could be pushed around. If you thought that, you were probably right. So what do they say about you when it's all been said and done? In fact, this woman wore pants in the 1880s. And she chomped a cigar. She didn't much look like anybody's idea of a 19th century Victorian woman at all. Equally thought-provoking was it seemed that she faced the fact that she routinely carried both a revolver and a rifle with her. And so she just wasn't talking to talk. She was walking to walk. walk. She, had, she had the backup. Amen. And so the, to the fearless fathers who headed the Catholic foundation of Cascade, however, this hefty heat packer simply looked like one of a hell of an employee, so they hired her. So for eight years, from 52 to 60, Mary Fields earned her daily living, her daily bread, by doing most of the heavy work around the mission, loading the supply wagons, hauling freight, and on one memorial one occasion, she fended off a pack of wolves with her guns. If you're wondering what that's called, it's called a job. <clears> Hello, <throat> she had a job. <laughs> True, she seldom showed up to work without a jug of whiskey in tow. And she could drink most anybody that this guy knew uh, later under the table. Nevertheless, there were a few, few complaints about the way Fields discharged her duties. Now, discharging her rifle in the direction of a hired hand and soldier was out for another matter. And so uh, the, the padre said, we can't turn the cheek on this. So they suggested the mild manner amongst, they, it was a better solution than firing people that got her upset. And so she, they sent her pack and they fired her. So here's our, here's our government. In its infinite wisdom, the U.S. government is very happy to put an aging, trigger happy Amazon on their payroll as a driver of a U.S. mail coach. So Mary Fields, now in her 60s, distinguished herself on many different occasions in very different climatic uh, conditions. She delivered mail in her 60s. And what are they going to say about you when you, when when you when all it's been all said and done that you've done? In 1895, although approximately 61 years old, Field was hired as a mail carrier became the, she, because she was the fastest applicant of all the men there to hitch a team of six horses to the mail carrier. She could do it faster than anybody. And so they gave her the job. This made her the second woman and the first African-American woman to work for the U.S. Postal Service. She drove the route with horses and a mule she had named Moses. She never missed a day, never missed a day, never called in sick. Her reliability earned her the nickname Stagecoach Mary, and I think they even made a documentary about her. If the snow was too deep for the horses, Fields, this woman, Fields would deliver the mail with snowshoes, carry the sack on her shoulders. See, what are they, what are they gonna say about your life when it's all said and done? Are they, are they gonna look back and say, you know, uh, yeah, she had some, some issues, you know, and her doctor wasn't really clear. But man, you've got to admire the spirit of that woman, man. She like got it done. You know? Especially when, after she'd been released from slavery. So what have we done since we've been set free from slavery? There's more to her story. And as she approached the age of 70, okay, I know what she's talking I'm 68, so you're looking at a 68-year-old man. So just two years older, this woman who lived in... Montana mountains and the snow and the sleet and hail drove a mail truck, mail, mail cart with uh, horses and a mule, amen. She's 70 years old, so even the West's toughest postwoman couldn't keep up the pace as her profession to men, so she gradually turned to a lesser taxi lifestyle. She became a laundress, which means she washed clothes on a, on a rack for people in a, in a laundromat. She was a respected public figure in Cascade. She, she went there and she lived her, the rest of her life in, 52 on, she made an impression on those people, amen. 
our birthday, each year the city closed its schools to celebrate. They celebrated this former slave because she had she had done what she had done just from her spirit. And when the Montana, when Montana passed a law forbidding women to enter saloons, the mayor of Cascade granted her an exemption. <laughs> The only woman permitted to a public ordinance to drink in a saloon in Cascade was Mary Fields. That applies to all you other babes, but this one, you come on in. Amen. Yeah. So I know her doctrine's off. I know that. But don't you feel her spirit? This was the pre, pre maytag era, however, and that occupation still required a significant amount of stamina. She was at one of the original wash borders in America. Man. You know, run, run that wash board. Between washes, Fields would maintain her muscle tone. 70 year old, by hoisting a few with the boys on the pub. One day she was exercising her personal privilege in the local bar when a customer who had neglected to pay his laundry bill happened to come in. She brought herself to her full height and the elderly washroom, she's in her 70s, accosted the offender, wouldn't pay his bill, and with one swift blow she laid him flat on his back. While well, everybody was just in awe. <laughs> This woman just took this guy up. She just wham! This guy's gone. But we ne he neglected his pay his laundry bill, so she just decided to take it out of his flesh. <laughs> Satisfied as that powerhouse punch must have been, she said at least one account, or so she announced to the astonished onlookers, was now settled in full. Okay, we're, we're cool now. See, God give us more men with a spirit like this woman. Willing to fight for something, willing to stand up and and, uh, and uh, do what needs to be done. And if this evening you're still bound, if you're still bound in sin, and you haven't been set free from the slavery of sin, I got good news. You don't have to leave here a slave. You can leave here free. You can leave, you can leave here free. Hands are bowed, eyes are closed. It's coming, church. It's coming. A season of discovery. Remember those words. Those are the words God gave me. To call it a season of discovery. Of many of the truths that we've grown up with and been around for our whole Christian experience are going to be reintroduced to us in a new way. We're going to, it's going to be a fresh set of eyes when you see them. And that God's going to begin to move again and multiply the, the people and the congregations. We're going to see our churches grow. Amen. As others are dying up and leaving the ministry and quitting because nobody wants to go to church, we're going to have people coming in and getting saved and giving their heart to Christ and getting filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues and, and doing all because God's God. And so before we do anything else tonight, you're here and you come tonight and you're just, you know, you're just living life. You don't know. You don't, you don't know. Can, can I tell you, Jesus is real. Now, I met him when I was 20 years old. I'm 68 now. I've had a full life of, of, of good times and bad times and other things been right but God has never been anything other than he said he is in his word if you're here tonight and you don't know him personally you've never accepted him as your savior it's not about a church membership it's not about it's not about you uh, uh, somehow uh, becoming a member of a, con uh, of a group of people but it is about you coming to grips with the truth of your life see God's word says and teaches us all have sinned all have fallen short. All. All means everybody. That means every, everybody. Doesn't leave anybody out. God says that's the call. All have sinned. And he says the wages of that sin, if you don't deal with it before you die, is this, you're going to have to pay for it with your own blood. If you simply accept the payment that's been made for you, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he sent his only son to die for you. Jesus came to the earth with one purpose. That was to die on a cross for the sins of humanity. This was God's plan. This is how he's going to redeem mankind from, from the curse of sin and all the, the nonsense that's in the world. He was going to do it by taking the, the problem by the, horn, the, by the horns, the bull by the horns, and do it himself. And so he crawled up there to demonstrate how much he loved us. And we didn't even know, the Bible says, before you even knew God, he died for you. You didn't even know he existed. He still died for you. He still did what needed to be done. And because he did it, 
Now there is a true way back to God, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. And so the way you get right with God is not becoming religious or Catholic or Mormon or Presbyterian or a Mooney or any, any Hindu. And not, not. You just come to an altar and you just be honest with God and say, God, I know I'm not right. I know I've done things wrong. And I know I'm not right. But I do believe you died on the cross for me. And I want to take this opportunity to ask you. See, he's a gentleman. God's a gentleman. To ask you to come into my heart. I remember when I, when I said that prayer, I, I had no idea what was going to happen. But what happened was God came down and touched me. See, the way you get right with God is you just believe what he says. You just take it at face value. You say, I believe, I believe he died for me. And you make that application personally. That's the only ticket out of this nightmare. Is that the blood of Jesus covers your heart, covers your, covers your sin, and makes you righteous in God's sight. Because the price for sin has been paid. God paid it himself. God didn't die just to die. God resurrected. See the power of God. He not only died for our sin, but he rose again. And so that's the hope we have, is if we die before he comes back, that when he comes back, we're going to rise from the dead. It, it's, 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 it's not the end of the road. Death is not the end of the road. It's just a dimension of we step through it into the next, into the next phase. And every person, listen, every person who does not simply do what I just said will have to face God and answer for their own life and their own sin. And, and uh, with their own, they'll have to pay with their own life. There'll be no, no other, there'll be no another second chance. There'll be no take this, take the test over. There'll be no next week service. It'll be done. If it happens before you, if you, if you punch out, and I don't put this on anybody, but if for some reason you walk out these doors, I'm going to think about it, and you happen to get hit by a car or something, and it, it's over. What's been done is done, and what has been said has been said, and what hasn't been said been left unsaid is left unsaid. So that's why that makes tonight such a powerful night. And so you're here and, and you know that's all you want. You just want to be right with God. Just want just need God to help you and you want to be a part of something that's real, not plastic or fake or phony, just real people. And you lift your hand right now. You're here and you just say with your hand if you miss me. I want to give my heart right tonight. All over this place. Maybe you want maybe you experienced this salvation and you fell away. Listen, I've done that too. I'm not proud of it, but I've lived as a backslider. It's a horrible existence. You don't belong to anybody. You don't belong to the kingdom. You don't belong to the earth. You're just out there in the Netherlands somewhere, out in the netherworld. Don't spend another day there. It's a lie. God doesn't hate you. He loves you. You just got to admit you made a mistake. I know it's going to be a little bit, you know, it humbles your pride. Yes, it does humble your pride, but that's what needs to be humbled. Because you're no match outside of God's grace for what's out in the world. It will eat you up and spit you out every time. Not care about you a bit. You can come home and get your heart right and make a fresh start tonight. That's you, lift your hand. Front to back, side to side. Yes. Yes. Okay, what I'm going to do then is we're going to stand on our feet. I'm going to open these altars in tonight. And I want you to come up here and I want you to think about those two questions. What are they going to say about you when it's all been said and done? And what have you done since you were set free from slavery? What have you done? Since you've got to set you free from slavery. And I'll give you the opportunity to talk to God for a few minutes before we pray. Let's stand on our feet. Amen. We sing a song, sister.
could stay here, I just want to offer a prayer for those that are watching on the live stream. You stay at the altar and we're up to right now. I just want to pray for those people. You're out in the live stream uh, listening to us tonight, Ted. You know, I want to pray for you. You, 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 you. you want to get your heart right with God. You know, I, I'm, I'm trusting that there are those that will watch. Maybe not tonight. Maybe they'll pick it up another night. Maybe they'll just be going through YouTube and see it and pop it pop it on. That's how God does sometimes. And just talk and just and talk. God talks to you. So I want to lead you in prayer and just uh, get your heart right with God. So repeat this prayer after me. Father, I come tonight in Jesus' name. And I know I've lived a life that's not right. I, you know, I have a conscience. I know that I've said things and done things and been a part of things and have been done to me and I've done to others that just are not right. And I feel bad. But tonight I've heard that there's, there is an answer. That you love me so much that you sent your son to die in my place. And that what you offer is if I will simply accept that and believe in it and walk in that. That when you come back, I will be accepted. Not because of my own righteousness. Not because of my own works or my own understanding but because I've simply believed in what you have provided. And because I've done that, I have a home in heaven and I have you as my father. I have all that heaven offers. And so tonight I just want to do that. I just want to say, God, forgive me. Come into my heart and change me. Make me a new person. And I will live with you. I live for you from this night forward the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Church, amen. Service times are, you know, on the, on the door, and you can come in and uh, meet some real people and learn some more about this God that's just touched your life. Hallelujah. And God, good. Amen. amen. He's an incredible God. And you know, I could step out and, and talk to some people, but I think what we need to do is just just listen to what God just said to us amen. about a season of ref refreshing season of fresh discovery you know it's one of those things that I can't I can't quantify I can't but I, I just know that I know it's gonna, he's going to do it again and, uh, and so I just want to leave I want to leave the revival on that note I know it's, it's, a, it's a zoo outside but you know what in all that's going on God is still God he's still on the throne nothing's changed where he's at he still rules and reigns forever. He still has innumerable angels that worship him constantly, 24-7. You know, Isaiah said his train fills the temple. And as the angels say, holy, 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 the, the temple shakes. You know, God is above the fray. He, he walks on the water. He's above it. He doesn't, you know, he, he's not going, wringing his hands, going, oh, God, like putting a hand still on my fingers, you know, what do I do next? You know, is this mask still going to help me? You know, he doesn't do it. You know, I'm not belittling any of those saints, but he, he doesn't do that. He's above it all. And so somewhere in all this chaos, he's going to begin to move again. Those that know him will sense it and will see it. Will know, will, will realize what's going on. See, that's the kicker. God, All that God has done in our fellowship up to this time as an evangelist, I'm going on records, all that God has done up to this time is to put us in positions. And so we have a relationship. And so when God begins to move, we'll know what's happening. It won't be a mystery. You know, we start seeing people just coming in, getting saved. They, who, did, who talked to you? Nobody. I just was, you know, and, and they're the, it's going to happen. And because of that, there'll be an acceleration. It won't be like it was in the beginning where we just had to begin, start, and build from nothing because we have all of this network of Christians churches around the world and so this is not just going to be an American thing it's going to happen in Africa and Australia and India you know, and China all these places God's just going to begin to move by his spirit and people are going to come in because I think he's going to do a quick work cut it cut it righteousness and take us all to heaven I guess we'll just have to live the rest of our lives and see if it happens but I believe it's going to happen 
That's, that's our destiny. Our destiny is to be those hand-picked Christians in this generation that God has in our fellowship that have, you know, there's other people doing it, no doubt. But as far as we're concerned, in our realm, we're the ones that he has positioned for the outpouring that's coming that's going to, that's going to ex, expedite and multiply the churches beyond, beyond understanding. And on that note, let's just give God praise as best we can. As you're seated tonight, I want to uh, I want to draw your attention to Psalm 112. You're looking to Psalm 112. He preached out of Psalms tonight, verses out of Psalm 119. So if you just pull back a few more Psalms, you'll find Psalm 112 is a Psalm that talks about the, uh, the, the state of the righteous, how they are blessed by God. Has anybody here been blessed by God? And as you read, just right from the start, praise the Lord, which by the way is hallelujah. Yes. The word hallelujah is praise the Lord. So is that the very first of this verse, uh, the, 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 the songwriter is starting off with a hallelujah, praise the Lord. Now, we read in English what was originally written in Hebrew, and uh, it's, it loses some of the sense, especially the structure of it. This song actually uh, uh, is... Uh, uh, it's, it's one of the acrostics. It uh, uh, every every verse starts with a a pair of Hebrew symbols, a pair of the Hebrew alphabet, uh, and it goes step by step more through the Hebrew alphabet for the first ten or eight verse eight verses that are there. And then the last two, uh, uh, it's got some other pairs. It's it's actually in the Hebrew. This song right here is it's it's written beautifully. It, it's an incredible look, way that it is all put together. And I don't have time to go in all of the structure of it and how that fits into music. Uh, so just believe me. <laughs> Just believe me that the way this, the structure of this song is absolutely incredible. And then in the English language, we are reading, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord and delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. Generations of the upright will be blessed. We've seen that play out. He mentioned the the father of our fellowship, Pastor Wayman Mitchell, whose descendants, whose disciples, whose uh, spiritual children have uh, been mighty in the earth. He goes on to say that wealth and riches uh, are in his house uh, and his righteousness endures uh, forever. I would dare say that every faithful family within our church, every faithful unit, individual unit within our church, whether you're single, married, married with kids, every one in our church can say, yes, God has increased our wealth. He's enriched us in the house of God as we come to church that God has brought increase to each one of us. We can all testify of that. Come on. So this psalmist goes so far, he points all of that out, which we've been wonderful uh, recipients of. We've experienced. You and I could be singing this song right now. Then he gets to verse 4 and says, Under the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious, full of compassion, and righteous. Gracious, full of compassion, and righteous. Do you know any time... In the Old Testament, when there are three adjectives that are used, it is always talking about God. Just make a note of that. As you read through the Old Testament, any time that you see 
three adjectives, three descriptors. Here, he is gracious, full of compassion, and righteous. Except it's not talking about he, God here. It's talking about he, you and me. You and I, who live righteous before God, it says that we are gracious, full of compassion, and righteous. As I was thinking of taking the offering here, everything that comes in tonight, we are going to give to our evangelists as we do always at the end of our revivals. We are going to give him an honorarium, we're going to give him a love offering. And as I was pondering, I was just I was just drawn to this psalm. And as I'm examining it, reading through it, uh, I was I was greatly humbled by the time I got to verse four. Because I don't know about you, but there's plenty of times I'm not gracious. <laughs> there's even times, believe it or not, this might shock you. There are times I'm not full of compassion. There are plenty of times. Where I cannot be called righteous. But it is Christ's righteousness in me. It is because you have submitted to Jesus Christ. That he who is righteous. Enters into our unrighteousness. And when we surrender to him. And simply obey his word. When we love his precepts, when we follow along with him, then because of Jesus, we become gracious, full of compassion and righteous. And that a good man, verse 5, deals graciously and lends or he gives and will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he'll never be shaken. The righteous will be in the everlasting, will be uh, in everlasting remembrance, he preached. He's asking us tonight, what are they going to say about you? If you'll be righteous and if you'll serve God, then you'll leave behind a righteous testimony. He'll not be afraid of evil tidings. Anybody ever heard of coronavirus? He'll not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees them. his desire upon his enemies. He's dispersed abroad. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He'll gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Thus ends that psalm. This psalm right here is talking about those that are true to God. They serve God. And because they submit to Him, there is compassion, there is graciousness, there is some righteousness. And then that song goes on to specifically point out that that man is generous. He, verse 9, he disperses abroad. He, he gives. Gives to this. He gives to this. He gives this. He gives to the poor. And his righteousness then endures. Paul picks this very thing up in his second letter to Corinthians. So trace this, trace this. This, this comes full circle. Now. Paul brings this home. We are all familiar with 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who reaps sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let everyone give so as he possesses in his heart, not grudgingly, out of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. For God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Just like I said at the beginning of this sermon, uh, beginning of this service, I need that grace. We need that grace of God. Amen. And he is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Let me translate that to what God has been doing to us. God has been able to bless us so that every opportunity we have that is good, we've been able to give to. God has so blessed us as a church that every good opportunity that there is, we 
are the and that Psalm 112 is our anthem because we've submitted unto your righteousness because we've believed your word. You have increased us and now we have the capacity to give abundantly. Verse 9, 2 Corinthians 9, 9, as it is written, he's dispersed abroad, given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Paul reaches back into Psalm 112 and brings it forward, makes it alive to the Corinthian church, uh, and takes it one step further. Listen to verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So what he is saying there is that it's God that gave seed in the first place. Not one of us can create a seed. Not one of us. But God did. As a matter of fact, God created it in the form of fruit and then allowed us to take our hand, lay it to that fruit, and replant it. It's all God's anyway. It's all God's. God created it and then allowed us to put our hands on it so that we could plant it and watch it multiply. And here in our text, here in 2 Corinthians, out of that song that was just sung, where we actually then become a reflection of God. Remember three adjectives that only describes God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Those three adjectives, that only describes God. But that psalmist turns it to us. We are a reflection of God. When we take what he has given to us, we take of that seed and then we turn around and we plant it, and God himself will multiply it. Two things will happen. You give to our evangelists tonight, two things will happen. One, God will return blessing back to you. Amen. He's going, he will. He absolutely, unquestionably will return blessing back to you. Not only in finances, if that wasn't enough. But he'll also bring that he's able to have all sufficiency in all things. It's more than money. It's more than dollars. You invest into a man of God and it affects peace within your mind and your home. It affects joy within your own life. It affects your relationship with God because you trust God a little bit more. Second thing, not only will God... Bless you. But all that is given and given into our evangelists, God's going to multiply that. What we give to him tonight, he goes from here. He's going to hold two services in Colorado. That's just the next stop. On he's going to go. Because we are sending him on with a worthy offering, God will take that and will even further multiply that. That is absolutely mind-blowing to me. But that's the promise that Paul says right here. And then he turns it back in verse 11 and says, While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. Finally, your giving to a man of God glorifies God. It gives praise to his name. I'm asking you to join with me tonight. If you write a check, make it to the Potter's House. We will count everything that comes in tonight. Uh, you can still give uh, online. You can go to SD Potter's House. Uh, if you didn't bring a uh, check, if you don't have cash with you, simply go to South Bay SB, sbpottershouse.com. Hit the donate button. Uh, those of you that are online and watching, take an opportunity right now to invest in this evangelist's ministry because you know he is a faithful man. Amen. He's come to us year after year. Amen. He started off this revival by saying, I feel like family here. You know, he doesn't walk into every church in every place and say that. That's not some shtick. That's not some rah, rah, rally. Let's get us all. Let's all. Oh, let's make us feel nice about the guy up front. No, that's genuine. That is heartfelt Genuine, and we we take care of family, don't we? Amen. We take care of we take care of family. So I'm going to ask you to join together with me. What you give 
God will bless you. So I'm asking you to give generously. Give generously. And then I want to hear your testimony. I want to hear in the coming days and weeks, I want to hear your testimony of how God has brought to blessing back into your pocket, back into your mind, back into your home, back into your job, back into your fruitfulness, back into your soul winning, back into your relationship with Him. I want to hear those testimonies. Amen. All right? Somebody's going to give me some testimonies here. Because we're going to believe God together for great things. Again, sbpottershouse.com. You can head to the website. Uh, I'd like to ask Chris if you'd come help take the offering uh, tonight. Uh, I want us to bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you, Lord, stitched together through time and eternity your truth and your promises. And Lord, from hundreds, even a few thousand years ago, you inspired a songwriter to pen words, to put them together in, in, a, in a spectacular manner, in a mind-blowing manner, put them together in a way that reached forward across Jesus into the New Testament. And it reaches still unto us today. Your righteousness still shines through us, God. Your graciousness you, O oh God, have given us the seed. You've put it within our hand and given us the ability to disperse it. And we're going to disperse finances to our evangelists tonight. I pray, God, that your word be true and real into all who are liberal. Let their cheerful giving heart be made even more cheerful. Cause their liberality to enlarge and to expand, not to them only, but also to our evangelists' ministry. Let us send Bob Burris off from this place to be even more fruitful through this year, we pray. And may you get all glory as we give testimony of your miracle-working power, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give tonight as we sing. I've got the life of God in me. I've got the life of God in me. I've got His life, His future, and His beauty. I've got the life of God in me. I've got the power. I've got the power of God in me. I've got the power of God in me. I've got His life, His future, and His beauty. Father's Day uh, this Sunday. Sunday night, we'll be back also. Again, any men who can help me Saturday morning, uh, help move the, uh, the church under uh, Pastor Dave Fowles this Saturday morning, please let me know. Let's bow our heads together and in a word of prayer as we dismiss. Uh, I'd appreciate if I could have Brother uh, Jake P. and Ultimate Jess God's blessing as we go. God, we thank you so much for the service, God. We ask that you bless Pastor Burris as he goes on to his next revival. Be with him, Lord, and touch that church. Continue to cause a growth in our church and bring a change in the fresh spirit of the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Us. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you tonight.
Uh, thank you guys for watching.